All right, folks. Got your cameras on. Can I see faces? Oh, faces? Real faces? <laughs> right. All right. Welcome, everybody. Today is a very special day. Tonight, tomorrow, it's our it's Rebbe's wife, Rebbe Sachaya Mushka, our Rebbe Tzin, her yurt site. It is 34 years ago that she passed away on this. Actually, uh, very it's like three o'clock in the morning, 3.30, I don't remember exactly. I get a phone call. Mr. Everson just passed away, and the Rebbe wanted that the family of Shluchin should be notified. So I got a phone call. Very good. Uh -huh. that tells you about why. about uh, her passing. And half an hour later, I was already in a car driving to Crown Heights um, for the Labaya. So tonight's class, in her honor, or her nishama. Okay, so anybody else uh, would like to share their screen with us? Please do. It makes it more engaging for everyone, especially for me. Okay. So uh, we've been engaged. But the exodus, the Jews are leaving Egypt. And for the last several weeks, we've been going through many a detail about the exodus. And finally, with the giving of the Torah, Mount Sinai, last week. And now we come to Parshas Mishpatim. Parshas Mish Mishpatim changes the topic from a narrative to civil laws, laws regarding property, damages, liability. And one of the things that is mentioned in this week's Parsha is the laws of oaths. That Torah obligates a defendant to take an oath in civil issues in three specific instances. First is, when you partially admit to a debt, as opposed to complete denial to a debt, right? If you completely deny that you owe, that, you know, someone makes a claim, you owe me money, and you completely deny it, then you, there is no oath to be taken. But if you partially admit, right, in the absence of witnesses, that you owe. So, for example, if Ruvain claims that Shimon owes him $100, and Shimon says, no, I only owe you 50 Shimon has to swear that he only owes 50 And if he takes that oath, then he doesn't have to pay the remaining $50. That's what the Torah tells us, as we will see. Second instance is, we know that when there's two witnesses, so something to, based on two witnesses, Yakum Dover, the thing is established, and it's established based on two witnesses, such and such, right? So if Shimon had two witnesses that indeed, I mean, uh, he paid, or rather, let's the other way around. Reuben had two witnesses that indeed he lent a hundred dollars and only fifty dollars was paid back and he still is owed fifty dollars now of course there's no if there's other proof you know if there's documentation we're not talking about that because then documentation will prove it but there's only the two witnesses so then based on that the court will judge but what if there's only one witness so the torah tells us if there's one witness and the uh, the claimant is saying that the defendant owes him money and the witness 
concurs with that, but it's only one witness. So based on one witness, we do not establish and we do not take that as sufficient evidence. It needs to be two witnesses, the Torah tells us. But what it does do is make an obligation or default up upon the defendant that he has to take an oath, right? That he doesn't owe the money. That's a second instance. And the third instance where there is an obligation for an oath is failure to return a deposit, right? A failure to return a deposit, then in such an instance, the Torah obligates that you need to take an oath. Okay, where do we learn this from? Where do we know this from? So let's go to this week's Parsha. So in this week's Parsha, we have the following verse that will be the source for the first and third situation in the um, partial admittance and failure to return a deposit. So the verse says, for any sinful word, for a bull, for a donkey, for a lamb, for a garment, for any lost article, concerning which he will say that this is it, ki in Hebrew, this is it. The pleas of both parties shall come to the judges, and whoever the judges declare guilty shall pay twofold to his neighbor. Double. Okay? So the simple meaning of this phrase is, ki this is it, means this is it, and not that. Right, But that itself suggests that there's another layer of meaning over here. So the Talmud derives that another law embedded within this verse of partial admittance. In other words, this is, uh, this is it what I owe, and not that. Oh, so that means that's the defendant's claim back, right? That this is what I owe, but not that. You're asking for more, but I'm saying it's less. Talmud uh, derives from this verse. Let's see it over here. Rabbi Baraba said in the name of Rabbi Yechanan, regarding one who falsely states about a deposit that a thief stole it, he is not obligated to take an oath until he denies part of the claim and admits to part of the claim. Remember, we said he doesn't take an oath if he denies it entirely. Only if he, the claim, he admits, he denies part of the claim, but admits part of the claim. Right? I only owe 50, not 100. What is the reason for this? As the verse states concerning that, what he will say that this is it, indicating that he admits it's only this part, but not more. Continues the Gemara, it is in accordance with the statement of Rabba. The Rabba said, for what reason did the Torah say that one who admits to a part of a claim must take an oath? Is because. So, okay. So, in other words, we learn it out from the verse because he says, this is it. In other words, this is what I owe, but not that. You're asking for more. I only owe less. So now, the Talmud is going to give us the, what's the reason that in this instance, the Torah is saying that you should take an oath. In other words, when you're made to mix us is the Hebrew term, when you have partial admittance, right? Then you have to take an oath. Why? So he says, it is because there is a presumption that a person does not exhibit, exhibit chutzpah, insolence, by lying in the presence of his creditor entirely at least. And this person who denies part of the claim actually wants to deny all of the debt so that, so to be exempt. And, uh, and the part, and the fact that he does not deny all of it is because a person does not exhibit chutzpah, insolence. 
Therefore, the merciful one imposes an oath on him to ensure that he will admit to the full debt. Okay, let's explain. Can I see some, um, can I see some faces here? So I know that you're listening. <laughs> First, teaching us a principle. A person will not outright lie in, in the face of someone that gave him, did him a favor, gave him money or whatever, or even if it wasn't a favor, if you deposited an article, you, you know, I, I deposited an article at a friend. The person will not outright lie that you own, that I own, own nothing. That's a principle. Now, are there some people that would? Yes. But the principle is that most people in a relationship with another person, because if there's money owed between two people, there's obviously some kind of relationship there, right? In that relationship, the Torah is telling us that the person would not outright be so chutzpahdik and say that, that, that when Reuben took Shimon to court and he says, you owe me $100, he says, I owe you nothing. I owe you nothing. We don't expect that. What will a person do? The person really wants to deny the whole thing, but he doesn't have such chutzpah. So what does he do? He denies part of it. No, I don't owe you 100, I only 50. Ah, so the Torah says, uh, the fact that you are not denying the whole thing, as a general principle, the principle here is that therefore, the fact that you're denying part of it means there's partial admission. Maybe really you owe the whole thing, right? And you're just trying, you, that you won't be so chutzpah to go so far. So you're only going to deny part of it. Take an oath. If that's the case, take an oath. That's the, that's the logic behind it. Is that clear? Yeah? Have thumbs up? If it's not clear, please say so. Okay, good. Now, so what do we see here? Torah is, is throwing upon the individual an oath in such an instance, right? Excellent. Now, Jewish law and tradition, we know how severe it is to take an oath. Because what is what are you doing with taking an oath? He's using God's name. Yes. And therefore, Jewish people always avoid taking oaths at all costs. In fact, many Jews who could absolve themselves, and rightfully so, rightfully so, because they're being honest, would rather pay than take the oath using God's name. That's how severe it is. It's a third of the Ten Commandments, right? So in the rare instances that an oath is administered by the basin, by the court of Jewish law, they warn the party regarding the, the gravity of swearing falsely. As we see in the Talmud, Tractate Shavuos, the judges say to him, beware that the entire world trembled when the Holy One, blessed be he, had said in Mount Sinai, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Beware with regard to all of other transgressions in the Torah. Punishment is exacted only from the transgressor. Whereas here, punishment, when you swear falsely, is exacted from him, from his family. Beware that with regard to all of the other transgressions in the Torah, punishment is exacted only from the transgressor. The transgressor. Whereas here, punishment is exacted from him and the entire world. Beware, and this is what the judges are saying to the person before he's taking this oath. That's how serious it is. Beware that with regard to all other transgressions in the Torah, merits will work to delay punishment for two or three generations. Whereas here, false oath, punishment is exacted immediately. Things that fire and water cannot destroy, a false oath can destroy. If the defendant says, I will not take an oath, the court dismisses, it, dismisses him immediately and rules him liable to pay. <laughs> he doesn't want to take an oath. Serious thing. 
If he says, I will take an oath, the people standing there say to each other, depart, I pray you, I, pr I pray you from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away in all of their sins. That was the story of Korah, right? That the, that the earth opened up and swallowed them up. So what does that mean? The last resort that you want is to give an oath. Again, even if the defendant is telling the truth, it's still frowned upon. The midger says, wherever you, uh, whether you're guilty or innocent, don't swear. So taking this into account, so what do we have? Very clear indication of, of you know, that we shouldn't take an oath. So it seems to be a bit puzzling. Why is the Torah putting this person into such a position that they would be administered an oath? So no, it, it seems, on the contrary, it seems like the, it's being orchestrated in a way that the person should take the oath. So, need to understand this. Let's back up for a moment and let's look at another verse in this week's Torah portion. It says the following And God said to Moshe, Come up to me on, to the mountain and remain there, and I will give you st uh, the stone tablets the law and the commandments, which I have written to instruct them. So Moshe and Joshua, Yoshua, his servant arose and God ascended, and Moshe ascended to the Mount of God. And to the elders, he said, wait for us here until we return to you. And here, Aaron and Hur, who is the son of Miriam, are with you. Whoever has a case, let him go to them. Okay. What do we learn from over here? So Moshe is going up the mountain. Who's left behind? Aaron and Hor. And what is uh, and what does God say? What does he say? If anybody has a case, meaning if there's a litigation that needs to be made, so let them go. Someone who has a case, let him go to them. So Simple meaning, Aaron and Hur have to take care of whatever litigation in the absence of Moshe Rabbeinu. But there's another law that is derived from here. Whoever has a claim should approach them. So our rabbis learned from this that the claimant must speak first. Rav Nachman said in the name of Rabbi Bar Avu, from where is it derived that the court first attends only to the claimant and only afterwards attends to the counterclaims of the defendant, as it is stated, whoever has a case, let him come near, vayigash, to them. Whoever has a claim against another should submit vayigash his claim to them first. So what does this mean? The order here has great ramifications to our case of, of partial admit, admittance, right? If the defendant would speak first, if the defendant would speak first and comes to court and says, I don't owe any money, I only owe $50, then what would happen? They'll make him pay $50. Right. He'd only have to pay $50. Does he take an oath? No. Why not? He, he came and admitted what he owes. Because he didn't make an admittance of a partial claim. To the partial claim. He admitted only that which he owes. So he wasn't, he didn't make a partial admittance. He made the full admittance from his side, right? So then he would not be administered at all. Correct?
But what does the verse teach us over here in our in this week's parsha? Who makes the first claim? It's the claimant, not the defendant. The defendant only speaks afterwards. And because he speaks afterwards, therefore, he will be making a partial admittance. And because of that, now he has to take an oath. So again, Ruben says, you owe me $100. That's the claim that's first made in court. Right? Shimon comes and says, I only owe 50. But because the order is first the claim and then the defendant, so therefore the defendant now is only making a partial admittance. And because of that partial admittance, therefore he has to take an oath. But in light of the avoidance that at all costs we should circumvent to administer an oath, right, as in this instance, have the defendant speak first. That way he won't make a partial admittance because it's so serious to take an oath. But we see that it's orchestrated the opposite way, that indeed he should take an oath. Why should it be that way if we're so concerned about taking an oath? Is the question clear? Yeah? Should I repeat it? Who wants me to repeat it? No, it's good. Repeat it, Sarah? Yeah, repeat it, please. No, repeat no. it. Okay. Yes, yeah, please. So we our, our 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 issue over here is we have two competing ideas, right? Two principles. One principle is that it seems that the Torah is telling us that when it comes to a, a partial, uh, when it comes to a case that Ruvain is claiming 100, Shimon is saying it's only 50, because he's making a partial admittance, he has to take an oath, right? Is that clear? On the other hand, we have another principle. So that's that that's a law. But we have a principle that this seems to fly in the face of. And that is, at all costs, avoid taking an oath. So why would the Torah set it up, so to speak, in a way, you know, that this person would have to take an oath? Let him just make his claim first that he only owes $50. And therefore, he's not coming as a counter, as a defendant to the claim. And therefore, he would not be administered an oath. They're trying to get the truth out of the story. Okay. Fine. Um... But the truth doesn't have to come only through an oath. Remember, I, I just a, an important concept that we've learned, we've discussed many times. Torah law is based on what the Torah is telling us, not based on a, a, on on a on logic or reason that we in our human minds feel that we should exercise. So we have two competing ideas over here. One is that the defendant, uh, that the uh, claimant makes the, the, the claim and then the defendant defends himself, right? But because of that, that goes counter to the idea of the, uh, that we try in every instance that we can not to administer an oath. That's, that's the issue. We try whenever we can, not that, that someone shouldn't take an oath. Look at the words that the rabbis use that when a person in fact does take an oath, it's a rare occasion because it's so serious. It's so serious. So if it's so serious, then maybe in this instance, you know, switch things around. <laughs> that's the, you know, right, the issue, right? 
So we don't, it doesn't want us to ask someone to take an oath or it's telling us that we should never take, we should avoid taking an oath. It's not that that- What did we say, what, what did we mention, what did we say earlier? We said earlier that uh, even if you are right, and by you taking an oath, you'll be absolved from making a payment and you're, and you're perfectly right. Better not to take an oath yet, which then would oblige you to make a payment. But that's how serious it is, right? That's how serious it is. As we see what the rabbis say, that the punishment is uh, very severe, not only to you, but to fam your family, the, to others, and not only, you know, and it's immediate, it's a it's a severe thing it's a severe thing so it's so severe so you know why is the torah not dealing with it in a way that you know to preempt it that's the question okay now the truth is if you look look in the code of jewish law and shulchan Aruch, um it, it seems to take this into consideration that although, generally speaking, the claimant generally speaks first, but there is a notable exception. Let us see. Shulchan Aruch says, we call upon a claimant first. If there is a significant loss for the defendant, we call upon him first. Hmm. So in a case of a significant loss, an exception is made. What, what, what's the distinction over here of significant loss? What does that mean? In other words, he has a reason why he didn't make the, the payment. Because if he would, if he would, if he has um, whatever, stocks, for example, or he has something of value, but if he were to sell it now, he would um, lose a lot of money. And because of that, he didn't make the payment. And that's what he can claim. He can claim that. So there's a significant loss. So as a result, um, the law of who goes first would be to that individual. Because, because of the significant loss, and he's saying, I only paid partially, because if I pay more, I'm going to have to sell off my property or I'm going to have to sell my stocks. And right now I would, I would incur a significant loss. The markets are down or, you know, the value of the property, they're going to see that I'm, you know, I, I owe the guy a half a million dollars and then people are going to see that I'm, uh, you know, really, um, I'm desperate. So I'm going to, I'm and incur a great loss. So in such an instance, the law is that that person can say their part first so that way they would not incur to take an oath. Is that clear? Yeah? Ahuva, uh, I see the wheels turning. Yeah, but he's not, he's not denying that he doesn't owe. No, no, he, he said, I owe 50, I don't owe 100. So the general principle, I owe 50, I owe 100, is that mm, maybe you're not being, you know, you, you wouldn't be chutzpah to deny everything, but, you know, you might be a little uh, wily to deny part of it, right? So therefore take the oath. But in this instance, this reasoning doesn't apply because the person is saying that if I would pay him the rest, if I would, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, I owe him 50. And the reason I didn't pay him 50 is because I would incur a significant loss. So I'm waiting till the markets go up so I could sell my stuff and then I could pay him 50, 50 million, right? Whatever the 50 is, right? So I could pay him. Even if the claimant is coming and saying he owes 100. Yeah, no, no, of course. If they both are agreeing, then there's no claim, right? There's no claim when there's a when they're in agreement. There isn't an other agreement. than the timing. The claimant might want his money now, whether it's a no, no, significant no. So, right. But but he's coming with he's the reason why he said. In other words, he's got a reason for why he hasn't paid. We wanted to. We wanted our principle before this concept was 
The reason why he's saying 50 is really he wants to say, I don't owe him anything, but he wouldn't have such chutzpah, right? So therefore he only says, I, I only owe him 50. But he's coming and saying a different story, right? He's, he's saying, I only owe him 50. And the only reason I haven't paid him is because if I sell now, I'm gonna have a, 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 incur a significant loss. Oh, so then our principle of maybe that he's trying to hide behind, you know, that he's only wants to get away with 50, he gets away with 50, that won't apply over here. That, re, that principle. So therefore, okay. in, that in, in that instance, we allow him to take the oath first. Why? So that way he won't be in a position where he has to take an oath. That's how serious it is. I hope that was clear. Can I get some thumbs up over there? Michael? I want two thumbs from you. Uh-oh. Leslie. Who takes an oath first? Who takes, huh? an oath? Who takes an oath first? The defendant? What? Who takes an oath first? Well, the oath, the oath would only be on the side of the defendant. That's not the issue. Yeah. The issue over oh, okay. here is because of the significant loss, he's, uh, he he's only... going to make his statement first, so that way he will not be in a position to take an oath. Oh, I see. Okay. That's the point. Yeah. Right? That's the point okay, over right. here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Oh, my gosh. Where, where's my lawyer over here? Where's my... Andrew? Oh, there's Andrew. He woke up. Andrew, please. Can you I, I don't understand. Yeah, well, that's the problem. I mean, this is Torah, and I'm thinking legally. I mean, if if uh, you no no no, you're thinking illegally. Uh, all right. Because if I if I sue somebody for hundred dollars, uh, fine. But if I'm willing, if 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 the, if I'm willing to say if I get sued, I owe the fifty dollars, and I'm going to take an oath. I owe him the fifty. I'm going to pay him. Why would it matter that? That uh, I, I don't understand. First of all, there's no counterclaim here. I mean, I don't understand the the, the genre of calling it a counterclaim. I, and and just I haven't understood the hypothetical that's even been presented, other than saying, well, I have to sell to cover my debt. I I I, I don't understand that. I don't understand the whole hypothetical here. Ruben claims that Shimon owes him a hundred. Shimon admits I only owe you fifty. That's clear, right? Right. So if what's he has to sell to cover what's his debt. What, one second. What's the halacha? Now what? Yeah, whether he takes an oath as to whether he owes it or not. He takes an oath. If he takes an oath, he's absolved from paying the other 50. That's all. That's what the Torah is telling us. I, I thought right? we want to encourage people that the, the taking of an oath is, is so serious that, you know. So if he takes an oath and says, I owe him the 50, I, I, I don't understand. What don't, what don't you understand? I, well, real quick, real quick. To, um, I'll keep if, listening. If no, somebody, wait, I'll explain, one second, one second, Uba. Andrew, explain what you don't understand. It, this is not, this is not, um, you know, uh, New Jersey, you know, a ruling uh, or a jurisprudence. This is Torah jurisprudence, right? right. So uh, explain to me. What is it that is? Not I, I don't. There's no doubt. I don't understand this counterclaim. There, there's no a counterclaim is. It's not it, a counterclaim. It, it, it's not a counterclaim. He's. Yeah, that's what I mean. Was, a counter. It, I mean, his the defendant is saying, "I only owe you 50. Right, but it's classified as a counterclaim. So, I mean, I, I don't understand why that's the interpretation. I mean, yeah, I don't okay. know. I I I don't know what the term. It's not a counterclaim that he's now making a claim against. If, him. In New Jersey, we have joint and several liability. So, argumentatively. If you ended up suing each other for property damage and you had more of the but property, he, no, damage. he's not suing back. Shimon's not suing back. Well, it's being well. That's my problem. It's being called a defendant's making a counterclaim. That's what the you know, language I, I don't said. Know he's, not, he's not making a counterclaim. He's that's just, what it said. It, I didn't say. Where is it? No, I thought I saw in the language it said. No, he's not making a counterclaim. Counterclaim would say, "No, Reuben, you owe me 50. Right. That's All a right. counterclaim. That's that, not what's I happening. It. <laughs> that's not what's happening. Yeah. Right? That's what's happening. He's admitting I, I, I owe 50, but not more. Clearly, the Torah tells us that in such an instance, the defendant has to take an oath. That's what the Torah is telling us. The right. Talmud taught us what's the reasoning behind here. 
The reasoning is that there's a principle over here that a person, right, as a general principle, by the way, there are exceptions. So like, for example, if you know a person is a dishonest person, he can't take an oath. It's only a God-fearing person that can, can take an oath. So you know that this guy is, uh, is a mafioso. You know that this guy is just not uh, an honest person, right? That person can't take an oath. It's only someone that, that the court will trust to take an oath, right? Because the oath is absolving the person from paying the, ex the, uh, the, the $50. So it's got to be someone you really trust. Yet, even in the trusting, there's a principle over here. You know why you're going to be taking an oath? Because maybe really you wanted to absolve yourself from the $100 claim by saying, I owe you nothing. But that would be such a chutzpah that you wouldn't do it. But, you know, to say, I only owe you 50, you know, that you can twist your mind to, to say. So the Torah says, take an oath, because an oath is going to is, is so serious. And we're talking about a person, it, uh, even someone who is an honest person, they play mind games, they play things in their head. So that's what the Torah is speaking. It's not speaking to it's not speaking to the the untrusted person. Is that clear? What if he says, "I only owe you, I only can pay you fifty." From the wait, 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 one second. Yeah, I'm going to take you to court. I mean, why is he? Oh, well, 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 I'm taking you to court on Alice. Alice, don't what? go further. I'm going to take you to court on that. Okay. <laughs> that's not our. That's not our situation. That's not what we're talking about. Do, 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 do. You bring another court. That's that's our Reuben and Shimon. That's oh. Levi and Yehuda. A different court oh. case. A different issue. Yeah, I'm going to have to come back another time for that one. Oh. <laughs> No, oh, no, 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 no. Let's not confuse issues over here. <laughs> okay. Are we clear now, Andrew? We're trying. <laughs> okay. No, man, don't mix things up. Don't mix other points. Don't get... Okay. Now. So now there is an instance that we just learned that Shulchan Aruch says that if a person... and a, Oh, so then we have our issue of we have the Torah telling us that don't take an oath at all cost. So we have an instance here where this person doesn't have to take an oath. When is that? When there's a formidable, significant loss to the defendant. So the defendant will say, I only owe 50, and the only reason I didn't pay the 50 is because I will have a significant loss. So I'm waiting for my stocks to go up. I'm waiting for my portfolio, my property to go up. So then I'll, I'll sell off and I'll pay him. I don't have what to pay, I'll pay him then. In such an instance, we're not, we don't think that that person's you know, like trying to get away with anything because he's got a, a valid reason. So in such an instance, he will make his statement first. So that way he will not be put into a position that he has to make an oath after the claim is made against him because the Torah tells us clearly when the claim is made and then you defend yourself and you own and you admit to partially owing you got to take an oath so the the rabbis didn't want to put a person in that in that position because it's very serious so serious that a person might owe might uh, the person could be telling a hundred percent the truth and still will not take the oath and pay the money rather than taking the oath. Just to give you the, the context. Okay? Oh my gosh. I'm out of breath. <laughs> it's very hard to be a lawyer. So I didn't know that taking an oath, even when you're telling the truth, is, is bad. Yeah. You don't want to be put in that kind of position. Maybe there, you know, there could be a little nuance, you know, you're telling the truth, but maybe there's something, you know, you see how severe it is what the rabbis are saying, right? Okay. All right, now I'm going to have my uh, time made up for me. This is going to be uh, okay. Okay. So now in the Sikha, the Rebbe does the following. Beautiful idea. Says we know that everything in Jewish law, the halachic 
you know, uh, ruling is ultimately evolves from a spiritual counterpart. Remember, I spoke about the vessel, 30 parts of a vessel, 10, 10, and 10, whatever for those of you who recall. Everything begins in heaven and evolves down here um, as a ruling based on the spiritual counterpart. So what we just learned, there's a spiritual counterpart to all of this, that where it kind of evolves from. So we're going to now learn the Kabbalah, the Hasidus of this idea. Okay, what we just learned. So we're going to zoom out for a moment, at least, you know, from our myopic look that we've had till now of trying to understand the, the nitty gritty. And we're going to now try to understand this in, in spiritual terms, what this teachings is talking about. Well, talk, I mean, talking about it is in a simple language is the halacha that we just spoke about. But in a more um, spiritual nature, it's also talking about. By the way, for those who come to learn Rambam, right? We, you know, so many of these things that I sometimes bring out in Rambam is, you know, we need to understand it as a spiritual counterpart. Okay, so we have two parties over here. We have the accuser. We have the defendant. So who's the accuser? So Job, Eov, teaches us Satan, Satan. He's essentially the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Talmud tells us. Follow carefully, folks. It was taught in Abraisa with regard to Satan. He descends to this world and leads a person into sinning. He then ascends to heaven, levels ac accusations against the very sinner, and inflames God's anger against him. He then receives permission to act and take away the sinner's soul as punishment. Meshachar says, Satan and the evil inclination, the Yitzhahara, are one and the same. Wow. So we all have an evil inclination. That voice in us that convinces us to do wrong. Right? That's called the Satan. Satan in English, if you want. The heavenly, and then that same voice in us, it's telling us to do wrong, that Yetzirah, the evil inclination. What does it do? Huh. It runs up to heaven and instigates the prosecution against us. And then what does it do? It becomes the executioner of whatever punishment that comes our way. In rabbinic literature, the Sultan is referred to as the Kateger, the prosecutor. The prosecutor's role is to constantly accuse the Jewish people of their shortcomings and their misdeeds. Identifying, identify the accuser. Now, let's understand what the accusation is. Following me? So now we know who the accuser is, right? Who's the claimant? That's our Yitzhahara, that's a Satan. So now let's identify, what's the accusation? So the, let's take our, the halachic point that we made over here. Partial admission. The claimant causes the defendant, the defendant who defaulted. Right, it isn't paid back. But defaulted on what was given them. You owe. You owe a hundred. That's what the Yetzirah does. It accuses us of defaulting of the spiritual loan that God gave us. He gave us time. He gave us the power and the purpose to fulfill. And we defaulted. We did wrong. We did something wrong. So he claims, the accuser, Satan, that the Jew sins. And now that Jew is indentured 
into the clutches of the Eight Sahara. You're mine. Hey, right? That's what Satan's trying to do. Make you mine. Now, as long as the Jew doesn't do anything wrong, no, nothing can be leveled against them. No accusation can be made against them. Can't be a claim against them. They did no wrong. But once a Jew does something wrong, right? He does something wrong, even in the slightest way that the Satan can make a claim against the Jew. So he makes a claim, you owe. And he's demanding. Pay in full. You're under my control of the Eight Sahara. He wants to have the full spell put upon you to be in his clutches. Right? In other words, that be in controlled by Klippa, by negative forces, and so on, right? So what do you do now? So what? who is the defendant? It's you and I. So what defense do you make? You admit partially. Yeah, I blew it. I made a mistake. True? Yeah, yeah. But you don't completely accept the claim that's made against you. It's only a partial admission. I don't owe you everything, Sutton. It's true that I did wrong. I didn't do it wholeheartedly. I was caught in the moment. The truth is, even in that moment, I was really still connected to God. The Alta Rebbe says in, um, Tuesday, I think it's Tuesday's Tanya, if I remember correctly, Tuesday, no, Wednesday's Tanya, chapter 24. After a sinful act, however, the sinner's animal soul, which animates the body and is integrated into it, as well as the body itself, return and rise from the negativity and draw closer to the holiness of the divine soul that pervades it, though. Divine soul always believes in one God and remains faithful to him, even while the sin is being committed. It's just that she, the soul, is trapped within the clutches of the animal soul that is compelling the body to sin. So yeah, sinning is wrong, it's bad. But even while we're sinning, the soul remains faithful to God. It's a momentary lapse, but it will, re will revert back. So the ATAR is, is, is claiming that you were completely invested in this. And we claim back, no, we weren't. We were kind of compelled. Really, we're connected to God. When we deny full investiture. Temporary insanity, we claim. Admitting we did wrong, but not to the extent that the, uh, that the Kategor, the prosecutor, wants to prosecute us with. We are essentially bound up with God. We remain pure and unsullied even in the act of doing something wrong in our, in our deeper soul. And even more so, even if I did this wrong thing, that's counterbalanced by the abundance of good things that I've done. They far outweigh the sins that I've committed. As the Gemara says, Rish Lakish said, with regard to the sinners of Jewish people, the fire of Gehenna has no power over them as may be learned from the golden altar. The golden altar in the temple was only covered by gold, the thickness of a golden dinner. Yet it stood for many years and the fire did not burn it for its gold did, did not melt. So to the sinners of the Jewish people who are filled with good, good deeds like a pomegranate is full of seeds. How much more so should the fire of the Gehenna have no power over the Jew? What does that mean? It means that even a Jew that is very removed is full of mitzvahs, like a pomegranate is full of seeds. So not only that when I did the sin, when I did the sin, I wasn't entirely invested in it. Partially, 
50. Not 100 like you say. Only 50. That's how much I owe. I don't owe it all. Because my soul was bound up with God. Yeah, it was temporary insanity, but I was still connected. Not only am I, was I connected in the after the deed, my soul was, is still connected to Hashem. But I've got more good than bad. So I don't owe you the full compensation that you claim the prosecutor against me because I have many good things about me. Right? That's his counterclaim. So what's the ruling now? Hmm? What's the ruling? Don't take an oath and try to do better. Do the whole, you know. <laughs> well, the first law is take an oath, right? The prosecutor is claiming 100. Me and you, the defendant, is saying, no, only 50. I wasn't, I wasn't lock, stock, and barrel. I'm not, I'm not Pharaoh of Egypt, <laughs> right? Right? I'm a Jew. Wasn't lock, stock, and barrel in, in, in this, right? Yeah. I owe. But only 50. Not the whole way. Right? So what's the law? Take an oath. What does that mean? What does an oath mean? Come on. You learned Tanya. What does it mean, an oath? The word in Hebrew for oath is shavua. It also comes from the word soveya, which means satiate. It means to satiate, fill up the soul, give it more power so it can overcome, invest in it more, give it more. So we can now, you know, overcome the challenge. It says that Rebbe Rasha, the godly soul, swears to be a tzaddik and not to be a rasha. Beginning of Tanya, right? It's difficult to understand why the godly soul swears. After all, the animal soul, which is the source of all the character deficiencies, such as anger, haughtiness, and, uh, and lustfulness causes one to become a Russia. Right? If so, why is it that the godly soul swears? The explanation is that the word shavua to swear is related to the word surveya, satiation. Satiation refers to the heavenly assistance granted to a person, giving them the ability to serve God by sending to him performing mitzvahs. This is similar to being in a state of satiation, full, which causes one to have strength and even more to be in good spirits. This is the meaning that we cause him to swear. We satiate him, the soul, by giving him the power that can be found in this supernal source to overcome the animal soul and not to be a rasha. This is also true when one makes an oath in real life. An oath obligates someone to overcome challenges and obstacles. The person is determined to keep uh, to keep th their word, and it reveals hidden powers that cannot be obstructed, as the people say, nothing stands in the way of the will. So too, the oath of the godly soul causes inner powers to become revealed, with which one can overcome all obstacles and challenges that are posed by the animal soul. So this is what's happening. This is what's happening. Again, we failed. Prosecutor is prosecuting. You're mine. All 100 parts of you. <laughs> right? You owe 100. You owe everything. 100. 10 times 10. 10 powers of the soul. Right? Times 10. I'm going to be completely in control. You're indentured to me. You owe me. And we say, no, 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 no. I wasn't completely engaged in that. It was a moment of folly. I know better. It was stupid. 
And not only that, I've got a lot more good deeds than I have negativity. So I only owe you partially. Okay, and the law is then, take an oath that you'll be absolved completely. Take it upon yourself to satiate yourself with so much more power that God can give you. That therefore, the claim is gone. Because now you're stronger than ever before. You're more powerful than ever before. More capable than ever before. You begin with such reserve, the reserves of the depths of the soul that are you, you're able to touch. That will sustain you, give you the inner fortitude to overcome at all times. Right? Which is wonderful, amazing. But there's one problem with that. And what's that? Think about it like in a business sense, you know. You, um, you failed in something in the business. So the CEO of the company, you know, the, the guy that, you know, um, he comes into the CEO and he says, you know, uh, I, I failed miserably with that and I lost the company a million dollars. I'm sure, you know, you want to fire me. He says, are you crazy? We just invested a million dollars in you. And now we're going to teach you so much more and give you so many more, so much more insight, you know, from we're going to help you that that won't happen again. Which is great, but it's a double edged sword. Because what happens if it does happen again and you do fail? And that could really bring you down to a bad place, right? That could be, it could be a risk because maybe all of that money that was spent on this guy was squandered. It's the same thing as over here. God's going to invest in you more, give you more so you can overcome. But maybe that's going to be a detriment. Maybe that's going to be in the end, you're not going to live up to it. And therefore you're going to feel much more guilty. <laughs> And then you'll, you'll feel really in the clutches of the prosecutor. Hmm. Is there any way out, though? Is there any way out? Come on. It's with just me. the cost was actually higher for the lesson that needed to be learned. No, that's not my question. Is there another way out of this predicament? Yeah, don't take the oath. To come and admit before the claimant comes. Ah, come and admit before the claimant comes, right? Remember that law? So what does that mean in spiritual terms? Right? So you don't need to take an oath. That's You want to get yourself in a position, you don't need to take an oath. You have to come before or the claim is made against you. What does that mean? You follow where we're going? I didn't take Make you sure you pay your debts. Uh, I didn't take you there. So get rid of your own ideas. <laughs> Leave the baggage at the door because otherwise you're going to be uh, not, won't get this. Okay. So I'm going to take you on a ride right now. So just follow the yellow brick road. Okay. We're going to understand this idea. So what do we want to do? We don't want the claim to be made against us. We don't want the prosecutor, the Sutton, to make the claim, right? Yeah, there's a failing. So how do you deal with this? Well, yeah, I could be given extra power so I could overcome, but that means a greater investment. That means it's a double-edged sword. So yeah, I could overcome, but maybe uh, if I don't, then it could you know, backfire and be much worse as a result. So what we need to do is that the claim isn't made that I right, 
before the, uh, the prosecutor is making the claim, I am going to state, make the statement first. That's where we're going. What that means, don't even think about it. Okay, promise? Let's go back. We're gonna go now to understand this by understanding one of the great um, scholars of the Mishnah, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai. We speak about him often. He was the leader of the Jewish people in Jerusalem when it was destroyed in the year 69. Famous story with him going out of the city, you know, meeting with Vespasian and, you know, with, anyways. So Gemara says, when Rabbi Yechon ben Zakkai fell ill, his students entered to visit him. When he saw them, he began to cry. His students said to him, Lamp of Israel, the right pillar, the mighty hammer. All these things are allusions to greatness of an individual. The man whose life's work is a foundation for, of the future, the Jewish people. Why are you crying? He said to them, I have two paths before me, one of the Garden of Eden and one of Gehenna. And I don't know on which of them, which they are leading me. And I will not cry. Whoa. Now, what's going on here in this story? Rabbi Yechanan. He was a great man, a God fearing, holy man and humble, but yet in his humility, it can't be a false humility. We're talking about a man who was a great God-fearing man, holy man, great Torah scholar, leader of the Jewish people in his generation. And he doesn't know where he's going. He thinks he might go to hell. Like, come on. Is this a case of false humility? Can't be. And if he doesn't, if it's like at this point, he doesn't know, why is he only thinking about it now? Why wasn't he thinking about what his fate would be earlier in his life? So maybe he'd get his life together if that's the issue. <laughs> right? So Rebbe explains a beautiful explanation in this week's Sicha. Rabbi Yechanan ben Zaki was consumed at every moment with his service of God by studying Torah and observing the mitzvahs. He was so involved with this mission that he had no time to halt his service and reflect on his overall state of affairs. How can he stop and think about himself and about his standing? Well, there's a mission to complete. However, at the time of his passing, when he has completed his life's mission, he stopped his work to finally make an honest accounting. After all, if he didn't do it then, when would he? And that is what caused him to weep. Listen to what it means, self-absorption, to a whole different level. What it means, self-absorption. Self-absorption, I don't mean that you're looking, you know, looking in the mirror to see how, you know, how pretty you look. Or you're looking to see, uh, of, you know, all the wealth that you have, or if you're looking to see all of the wonderful good things that you've accomplished in your life. That's not the self-absorption that we're talking about here. How about serving God genuinely and uh, thinking, hmm, am I doing this right? Or am I doing it wrong? What am I holding? Is my heart in the right place? Do I really have a love of God? Or am I just going through the motions? Right? Rabbi Yechonah had a different approach than this. His approach was, he didn't want to enter any of that into his mind. He wasn't worried about what's his status. Where is he holding? Is he really a, a good servant of God or not. There was only one thing that was important to him, fulfillment of the mission that God placed upon him. And if I have an extra moment to breathe, that I could do something more in that mission, that's all that counted. Therefore, he never stopped working on it. 
not for a moment, so busy in his life's mission that he would never ponder. This is for him self-absorption. Thinking about where, what's my standing? When does he think about it? The last moments of life. And this is the message that Rabbi Yochanan is giving to his students. My dear students, don't waste time dwelling on the past. Not dwelling on the past in, in, a, in a negative way. Even, even thinking about the past that, you know, I could have done that better. Or, you know, I mean, if it's about you can learn from the past so you can be better, that's one thing. But like dwelling on the past so... So you can know your state of being. No. No time to cry now. Don't waste your limited resources. God has provided you with X amount of days and years to live. Use it out fully to fulfill your mission. Now, let's take that notion and apply it to what we're talking about here. When the Satan, the prosecutor, confronts us and wants to collect the debt from us, so there's two general approaches. The first way we, are, we detailed earlier, you take an oath, meaning you satiate yourself with greater strength so that you'll be able to overcome next time. But there's another approach, and that's avoiding taking an oath entirely. Go first. There's no there is no court case. There's no accusation, no oath taking. This is Rabbi Yechonin ben Zakkai's approach. Instead of getting involved in a legal battle with your Yetzirah, you're too busy serving God and fulfilling the mission that He placed upon you. After 120, we'll th we'll have the conversation. <laughs> right now, I've got to do a mitzvah. Right now, I've got to help this person. Right now, I've got to study Torah. In this case of a significant loss in which an, an oath is avoided altogether, what's Rabbi Yechanan's significant loss? A moment in time that could be used to serve God was precious to him. An hour is a day. A day is a month. A month is a lifetime. That's how we saw it. That's a significant loss. Every moment is. There's too much at stake, too much to lose, to get into a debate and to figure out who's right, who's wrong. How much am I wrong? What do I got to fix? Take the high road. Move on. In the words of the Rebbe from this week's Sicha, the Rebbe says the following. The years and the energy that God grants us to complete our mission in this world are the property of a Jew. When a Jew is completely committed to the extent that their entire being is doing God's mission, and the entire time and energy are devoted to completing their godly mission to make this world a dwelling place, then they have no time to go to court to a court case with the Yitzhak Sahara. If they take the time to go to court, to a court case, then they are financially ruined as they're God-given time and power become devalued. They are not utilizing their precious assets, right? Time to fulfill your mission is the most precious asset you have in your life. Therefore, we accept their claim and they're exempt from making an oath. Why? Because all they want to do is use every moment that they have to serve the purpose that they were created for. So therefore, their claim comes first and they're exempt from an oath. They don't need to get more power right? All they do is focus in on what God needs from them. We are certain that they will not fall under the sway of the Yed Sahara as a result. What does this mean? What does this mean? It means like this. You do something wrong, so you try to build yourself up so you become stronger, right? 
And then all of a sudden, what happened? Oh, I said that stupid thing to my spouse again. Oh, I did this to my kids. Ah, oh, I spoke to my to my parent. Mm. And here I built myself. I worked on myself to that I shouldn't do that. I never did it again. What's gonna happen? Become despondent. You become like, what's with me? Oh, I come. Whatever. Can get my act together. Obviously. Right? Obviously. That was the first approach, taking the oath. This approach is just focus on one thing. You have a mission that God needs you to fulfill, that he's given you a godly mission. If you don't know what that is, then it's Torah mitzvahs. That's what it is. How it expresses itself and what, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a school teacher, whether it's a mother, whether it's a, a lawyer, whether it's, uh, you know, a pharmacist or, or whatever. It doesn't matter that that's just the outer shell. You're serving God, Torah and mitzvahs. And you've got a mission to fulfill. And you're just focused on that. So there's no time for other things. Yeah, so in other words, what happened? Okay, you did wrong. Pick yourself up and devote yourself to that mission. Don't look back because then you have a prosecutor who's trying to look at your negativity. And what happens to you? You start thinking about it. Oh, I'm not really such a nice person. You know, I really got to work on that. Now, if that's part of your mission, fine, but but that's not the point over here. The point is, that's look. Don't look because of, you're being prosecuted, be, and because you did something wrong, and now you're feeling the guilt of it, and you just you know, got to work. No, no, no. Focus in on what God needs from you. He put you here. He has a mission for you. If you just focus in on that then you don't need extra power because that is the ultimate thing that you can accomplish that is what's needed of you. And with that focus, um, yeah, well, we might fail, but then there's only one thing back, get back to the mission, focus. So for example, in the middle of davening, and your mind goes astray. So it started, started feeling, oh, I, I really got to strengthen myself. I, I really need more power to overcome this. And you learn, and you do this and that. And all of a sudden, you're back to the same place. No, just focus on the thing. What's the mission right now? The mission is, I'm davening. Focus. That's the mission right now. Just do that. Are you worried about, don't worry about what happened, your deficiencies. Don't go there. Davin. Ah, uh, you're learning Torah. And you're trying to do three things at a time. And that's why some of you don't have your face showing right now. Because you're doing three things at a time, not even two things. Right? Because you're focused on so many missions or omissions, <laughs> right? So instead of, oh, I really got to work on my focus. I really got to work on being able to be, um, you know, uh, not to multitask when I'm doing a mitzvah. I've got to be focused on this one thing that I'm engaged in right now. And I got to develop that and work on that. Uh, do it. And you're going to see what's going to happen. You're going to fail again and you're going to feel despondent. Don't do that. Do one thing. God gave you this moment. This is what he, the tasks that he needs. This is your mission right now. Your mission is to do three things. Your mission is now to learn Torah and to just focus in on it. That's it. That's the only thing that exists. That's your mission right now. What your mission will be in 15 minutes from now, different mission. Or a different part of the mission. Not a different mission. It's all the same serving of God. That's what it is. That's all I got to do. That's what I'm going to 
And, and you're doing that every minute. So Rabbi Yechanan, his whole lifetime, didn't have a time to think. Oh, where am I holding? That's what we need to, where we need to hold in our lives. Halavai. Because the other way can trap us. Because we're going to, you know, going to go to therapy, right? And the, and the therapist is going to tell me, yeah, 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 yeah. You've got this uh, nasty thing about you. And, you know, okay, here's some ways, some tools on how to work on it, right? And not to say maybe there is, uh, you know, a, a place for it and a need for it to help you so you can overcome. But there's something greater over here than that. Focus in. God's mission that he has for you. And when you focus in that you are doing God's mission right now, and whatever it is, somehow you'll find the wherewithal on what you got to do. Ah, you failed? Okay, focus in again. Pick yourself up, refocus, and that's what you got to do. With this, we can appreciate a letter that the Rebbe wrote to a young orphaned woman that she should increase in her Torah observance, They're impressing upon her that nothing can stand in the way of one, what their real inner will is, and cautioning her about the past and the wrongdoings of the past. When one feels, uh, one feels feelings of guilt and regret about past behavior, they must investigate the, which side is generating these feelings. Is it from the eight or toe or from the opposite side? The litmus test is the outcome. If these thoughts lead to greater strength and energy to serve God and to live in a, a life in accordance to the Shulchan Aruch, this is a proof that's coming from a good place. However, if it's thoughts, the, the thoughts lead to laziness or despair, this is a proof that they originate in the Yitzhahara since these feelings prevent one from serving God. Regarding your good deeds benefit, uh, regarding you, good deeds benefit the soul of your father of blessed memory, not feelings of despair. Surely your spiritual counselor, counselor will explain this in great detail. Right? Do good. Focus on your mission. And similarly, the Rebbe writes to an, someone who is an alcoholic complained that despite his best attempts to quit, unable to resist the urge. The Rebbe gave a number of practical pieces of advice, but prefaced with this. The words of our sages is that this matter are well known. One should not become despondent if he does not withstand the test. He should surely not despair in his fight with the eight Sahara. To the contrary, despair and despondency are the weapons of the eight Sahara, telling a Jew that there's no use fighting, you won't succeed. To the contrary, if you relapse and you see how bad it is, for after all, this is against the, God's will, and it also leads to destruction of one's physical material life, that itself should energize you to take up arms in the above-mentioned battle. Eventually, the promise of when a person sanctifies himself in a small measure below, they sanctify him in a great measure from above will be fulfilled in your life. So, not to, as important to make the calculations, to, go, to, to try to figure out where you're holding, that will bring you to a place of despondency perhaps, but be actively engaged in the mitzvah of the hour, the mitzvah of the moment, get the job done, and everything else will fall into place. If that's what we can focus on. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? Mind blowing. Thank you again. Thank you. I hope it came clear in the end. Absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. I was in court today. <laughs> All right. And just put me back on mission. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the only thing that counts. The mission. 
We are. We all have been given a mission by Hashem, and we um, we just stay on track with that. If we have a question about what that mission is, it's Torah and mitzvahs is the, is the mission. You know, what should be my emphasis? What should be this? And okay, that's already, you know, some of the details that needs, you know, to be dealt with. But that's the general mission. And the specifics, you know, are uh, further discussion. All right, folks, thank you very much as always. Amazing. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. 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 Thank you.